Greetings, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland. I'm on Onslow Gardens in London, and behind me is the statue, where, not statue, huh, the house where Andrew um, Bonner Law lived and indeed died. So he was born far, far from these shores. He's born in New Brunswick. That's now part of Canada. But when he was born, Canada didn't exist as such. Or what, what was then called Canada is now only what's now Ontario and Quebec. Confederation of Canada took place in 1867. So Bonnelaw was Irish and Scots by his parentage. His father was a um, free Presbyterian clergyman. Um, so uh, it was a it was solidly middle class, didn't have that much money. But when he was 12, they returned to Great Britain. So then he went, he was in Glasgow, he went to Glasgow High School, which many regarded as the best school in the city. Um, so his, his um, surname was actually Law, but he's, um, they decided that he'd just be known by as Andrew, as Bonner Law, not just Law. Um, and it's often mispronounced Bona, as in the American uh, vulgarity, which is, which is a mispronunciation, it's Bonner. Uh, anyway, um, so he was gifted at languages, he had a good head for figures. Uh, he was a he was a superb chess player. Could have played professionally, but uh, it was decided that he wouldn't pursue um, an academic career. Very very few people went to university in those days. So he joined a, a firm when he was 16 and decided to work his way up an uh, an iron merchant's firm. But he made a fortune in his 20s. Um, then he wed. He decided when he was 30 he was going to enter politics. Um, stood for, for election as a Conservative in uh, Glasgow Bridgeton. You wouldn't get many Conservatives in Glasgow Bridgeton these days. Um, anyway, so he, he firmly believed in the union of Ireland and Great Britain, of Scotland, England, Wales, with Ireland too, uh, completely against Scots separatism, which, which was scarcely existed at the time. Um, so he, he represented various Glasgow seats, eventually he represented seats um, in London like Dulwich, and I can't remember the exact dates of when he represented which constituency. Uh, fairly conventional um, in his views for a Conservative, but uh, unusual coming from a middle class background. Most Conservatives were very much blue blood and broad acres. So uh, he, he rose up the, the ministerial ranks and then obviously the Conservatives were, 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 were in opposition. But uh, in 1911, the Conservatives had just lost three elections in the, in the row, in a row. What to do? No longer the natural party of government. So it's between Walter Long and um, uh, and Austin Chamberlain for the leadership. But it was thought that it was feared that if either of them won, it would tear the party in two. They led two opposing factions. So as a compromise candidate, Bonner Law had been a distant third. Was decided that both withdrew in favour of Bonner Law, so he took over. Now he wanted tariff reform. This idea that. Um, and the British Empire would be a trade block, but there would be tariffs as in import taxes on any goods coming from outside the British Empire to persuade people to buy within the empire and that that would, would, would stimulate prosperity. Other people said, no, that's terrible. The Liberal Party believed in free trade. This had bad memories of the Corn Laws, which had only been abolished in the 1840s and would make, the, would make food dearer. And uh, you've got to remember, in, in um, this time, the Edwardian era, Food was people's major expense. You couldn't assume that everybody could easily afford three good meals a day. Some people were really living in penury. There were shoeless children and so on. So um, the Liberals were able to use this against them, going around with a big loaf and a small loaf and saying, well, which would you rather for a shilling? You're just going to make food more expensive. So perhaps that wasn't a winner. It did come in in some form in the 1920s. A bit like talking about protective tariffs these days. Anyway, uh, he was also um, dead against home rule for Ireland which is uh, un un unsurprising considering his father was an Ulster Protestant. Um, and it, by the way, Bonner Law is the only Prime Minister of um, the United Kingdom who was not born in either Ireland or Great Britain. Anyway, it's perhaps surprising somebody come from a mere bourgeois background would be leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party, party but leader he was. Uh, now, Austin Chamberlain, he, well, I suppose he was middle class too, but born in Birmingham, son of the Lord Mayor of Birmingham, uh, very wealthy, So, but Bonner Law didn't even start out with very much money. Walter Long from an upper class um, Irish background. Anyhow, um, so the First World War broke out and Home Rule was delayed, uh, but what was going to happen, it seemed that Home Rule in some form was going to come in, and uh, he was um, flirting with the Ulster Volunteer Force, the British League for the support of Ulster and so on, had spoken at a huge rally at Blenheim Palace. The Duke of Marlborough was sponsoring that one, saying that uh, we'll do anything to prevent Home Rule. 
um, I can imagine no length to which the people of Ulster would go, which the Conservative Party would not be willing to support them, so saith Bonner Law, which was shocking for someone who prided himself on the constitutional character of his party to be uh, coquetting with the idea of insurrection, indeed civil war. Um, he, he gave short shrift to Irish Republicans when they wanted to rebel. The First World War broke out, and that was, that was so delayed. Um, one of his sons was killed in the war, um, and he was Secretary of State for Colonies. He was Chart the Exchequer as in Finance Minister. I remember in December 1916, there was a parliamentary coup against Henry Herbert Asquith, the, the Liberal Prime Minister, um, who had um, developed dipsomania when his dear son Raymond was killed fighting. And there was the shells crisis, not enough shells were being produced. So the Liberal uh, Chartered Exchequer, David Lloyd George, he had a minority of Liberals, about a third of the party, and they grew the Conservative Party to uh, say they had no confidence in, in H. H. Asquith, so he had to go. Asquith stood down as Prime Minister. Lloyd George became Prime Minister, a Liberal, but most of his cabinet were Conservatives. Remembering, and certainly in 1902, uh, he'd been absolutely abominated by the Conservative Party. Uh, Lower George, he'd been seen as pro-Boer in the Second South African War. They detested him over the people's budget. Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief. Taffy came into my house and stole a piece of beef, piece of beef and so on, using cumrophobic tropes against uh, him just because he was trying to alleviate poverty from the people's budget. But the Conservative Party um, is nothing if not pragmatic and that they were willing to shake hands with the devil as they saw it, were always forgiven um, about Lloyd George. Um, an appetite for power is what the Tory party has, as a later history of the party said. So um, Bonner Law served under him in various uh, capacities. Then the war ended and then the wartime coalition continued with Lloyd George liberals and most of the Conservatives in it. Um, but uh, by October 1922, many backbench Conservative MPs were unhappy with this arrangement continuing, and they, they said, we've got to withdraw support from Lloyd George as Prime Minister. So that's why there's the 1922 committee, which is a committee for backbench Conservative members of Parliament. Backbench is in, they're not cabinet ministers or in the shadow cabinet, because obviously the cabinet of roughly 25 ministers, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor Exchequer, i.e. Finance, Foreign Secretary, Home Secretary, Health Secretary, Education Secretary, and so forth, all in charge of a different portfolio. And then if you're in opposition, you have an opposi you have the shadow cabinet, you're watching the cabinet, and then you are critiquing your opposite number. If you're a leader of the opposition, you're saying what the Prime Minister is doing wrong. If you're shadow chancellor, you're saying what the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer is doing wrong. If you're shadow transport secretary, you are criticising the transport secretary for whatever he or she is doing wrong, and so on. Um, so anyway, that arrangement was brought down. Now, he'd been leader of the Conservative Party for 10 years, then he stood down, then Austin Chamberlain came in, briefly. Austin Chamberlain went out, as is the son of radical Joe Chamberlain, the Liberal Unionist, and the half-brother of Neville Chamberlain, later Prime Minister. So um, any time two, two brothers have led the same political party in the United Kingdom. Um, so the, the next thing was Lloyd George fell as Prime Minister, went to the palace to tender his resignation to the King Emperor, and therefore Bonner Law was invited to form a government. He became First Lord of the Treasury. He went to the people immediately, seeking a dissolution of Parliament. His request was granted an election, and the Conservatives won a very significant election in 1922 because the Liberals were pushed into third place. Up until this time, um, uh, the Liberals had been, well, the largest party. All of a sudden, they were the third party, and the, the Conservatives were the largest, but Labour was the second biggest party. Labour became the second biggest party in the United Kingdom, and so it has remained for 98 years. And even now, even after their drubbing, there doesn't seem much chance of that changing. Um, so he, he um, wanted to bring back tariff reform. He wanted to deal with mass unemployment. Um, because so many people would be demobilised, there was a slump, what were they going to do about it? Paying off the huge war debt, renegotiating these enormous loans from the United States to reschedule them over a longer period of time. Would the Americans forgive some of the loans? Um, because there might well be a balance of payments crisis. How could they balance the budget? Because they, 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 just the national debt had ballooned in the First World War, and it seemed almost unmanageable. Then there were so many war widows' pensions to pay, there were so many soldiers being invalided out, were permanently disabled, having had um, limbs amputated, were blinded, deafened, or just so raving mad from their ghastly experiences. Um, the uh, Irish Civil War had kicked off, you know, the major portion of Ireland, we were outside the UK by that stage, and um, 
uh, would there, w w were diplomatic relations to be established with uh, the Soviet Union, questions like that. The United Kingdom would only just disengage from Turkey, the Chanak crisis, in which um, he hadn't given a clear line as to whether he supported what Lord George was doing. But anyway, in 1920, um, Three, it was discovered he had advanced throat cancer, so he stood down and he served only seven months as Prime Minister, dying just a few months later. Um, uh, so he, his funeral was held at Westminster Abbey, um, and um, uh, someone quipped, we buried the unknown um, Prime Minister beside the unknown soldier, because that's the tomb of the unknown soldier. And indeed, there's a later biography of him entitled The Unknown Prime Minister, because he was an undemonstrative man, he was uh, very quiet, he wasn't a very inspiring leadership figure, but that was Bonner Law nonetheless. Um, so there are a number of biographies of him. That's enough about Andrew Bonner Law. Toodaloo.